All right, we're ready for Proverbs 23 and 24 in our study and our survey through the book of Proverbs. Um, I want us to move on into our outline of chapter 23. I appreciate Drew teaching the class last week while I was away in a meeting. Quite a bit of information uh, we have here uh, that we want to look at. We are outlining chapter 23 and 24 like we do many of the others, grouping them by subject matter. And if you're making your own outline, which I hope you are, you may have different headings. You, and as we've repeatedly mentioned, you may put a verse under more than one category. Uh, it may talk about the tongue and at the same time talk about wisdom and even righteousness versus uh, unrighteousness. Those kinds of things happen frequently. So let's start our way through. Uh, verses 1 to 3 have to do with setting before a ruler. It's broader than that, but that's what it's talking about, and we'll see that in just a second. Um, let's go to question 1 first, and then we'll come back to the text. What is meant by put a knife to the throat, verse 2? Yeah, self-control. Self-control. We'll say more about that here in just a second. Let's start at verses 1 to 3. They go together as a unit of verses grouping together. And notice points 1 and 2 on the outline, setting before a ruler and also self-control. Uh, we learn from this and we learn even more. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. And put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies for they are deceptive food. Um, I think the idea here is uh, broader than just the setting before the ruler, but it's the idea of going before a ruler. If you sit down before the king and he's offering you a great feast, it's not likely he's doing that just to favor you, but he's probably wanting something from you. And so the point is it's a warning about excess. We could easily be tempted by excess. So the idea of putting a knife to the throat is not literally pull a knife out and stick it to your throat, but it's the idea of using some restraint as if you have a knife to your throat. Use some self-restraint, self-control. The d delicious delicacies may taste good and they may promise great pleasure, but if you eat in excess, you may have some problems from that, even health problems, but that's really not the point. I think it's talking about be careful. He's probably trying to bribe you. Um, now, let's broaden that out just a little bit. You say, well, I probably will never sit, uh, even sit down to eat with the king or a president or a governor. I probably won't even never sit down to eat with the mayor. So I probably will never have that opportunity. I understand that, but how could we make some application of that? That probably happens to every one of us. Yeah, it's the same principle when somebody showers you with favor and with blessings and attention, etc. Be very careful. They may not be wanting something now, but they may use that as leverage for something they want later on. I found this to be true sometimes in, uh, when a preacher moves to a congregation and he's new. There'll be some people who will just overpower him with, with, with food, with uh, kindness, and doing things up to a point when he says something they didn't like and he's done, they're done with him. But they were looking for favor from him. They're looking for favor. They're looking for something to use as leverage. Be careful and weary of the person who is just constantly flattering and they're overpowering you with gifts. And, and uh, just be careful. Just be careful. That's part of the warning given here in the text. Avoid excess. The idea of putting the knife to the throat may also include, some have suggested, excess in talk. When you go before the king, don't just gorge yourself. Be careful of the food that he's putting before you, but also put a knife to your throat. You might be careful what you say, what you commit to, what you agree to, what you tell. We need to put a knife to the throat sometime. Make sense? All right, self-control setting before the ruler. Let's go to riches, verses 4 and 5. What do we learn about riches in verse 4 and 5? What else do we learn? <laughs> They're temporary. Say again? Temporary. They're temporary, good. 
What'd you say? They flee. What else? Don't set your mind on riches. Proper balance. Proper balance. I wanted to check um, the, um, a couple of translations. That's, that's Proverbs 23, 4. Um, I find this one interesting. Um, the English standard says, do not toll to acquire wealth, be discerning uh, enough to desist. The new century, though, uh, do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to control yourself. I like that. The NET says, do not wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. In other words, if that's your primary goal, don't, don't wear yourself out and kill yourself trying to get rich. Um, use some judgment um, and, and uh, restrain yourself from that. Now, verse 5 tells us why. Why would your eyes set uh, on what is not? For riches certainly make themselves uh, wings. What is he saying? Yeah. Yeah, they fly away. So, so why set your eyes on something that doesn't last? It's not lasting. It's not permanent. It's gone. It doesn't have any real value to you. Uh, so be careful about riches. Now let's go to verses 6 to 8. Let's go to our questions first, and then we'll come back. I call this section, Watch the Envious or Covetous Man. It's broader than that. But what, uh, why should one not eat the bread of a miser? Question two, by the way. Yeah, he's not genuine, he's not real. Do not eat the bread of a miser. The English Standard and New International say stingy. The New American Standard says selfish. Now, let's stop before we get, go any further. I think King makes an interesting point here, that is in his commentary that it's likely that the text is assuming that the one who is invited knows the nature of the one who is the host. So in other words, if someone that you know is a miser, that you know is selfish, uh, that really is not prone to, that's stingy, that's not prone to give, uh, do not eat their bread when they say, look a little bit later here, he says, eat and drink, he says. Be careful of that, why? Heart's not with him. Now, verse 7, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We quote that often, you know, what goes in our mind, that's what we, how we function. Uh, what man is in his heart, that's the true nature of man. But in this context, he's talking about the miser. The miser who says, eat, eat, that's not the true character. We know his true character. He's stingy. He doesn't give. But he's saying, he takes you out to eat and says, get anything you want. Now, when has he ever said that before? Uh, that's not the kind of man he is. You know he's tightwad, and he's stingy, he's covetous, and he's telling you, order anything you want. Well, what's the warning here? He probably doesn't want you to order anything you want, number one, but there's something else in mind. His heart's not with you. Now, verse 8, the more so that you have eaten, you'll vomit up and waste your pleasant words. What's that about? Yeah, you wish you hadn't, you hadn't done it. He's out to ensnare you. There's, there's, there's a motive here. Here's a guy that doesn't have any use for spending a dime on you, and suddenly he wines and dines you and offers you all kinds. Here, take what you want. He probably doesn't mean it, number one. And number two, if he does, he's probably out to ensnare you because he's a covetous man. He's, he's stingy. Uh, he is, uh, what was the other translation? He's stingy. He's selfish. Uh, he's trying to bribe you, so be careful. In other words, keep your eyes open, keep your eyes peeled. You, you need to be careful about that. Let's go to verse 9. We'll just quickly deal with this uh, because this is a repeated principle over and over again. What's the warning about talking to a fool? Yeah. It's the same principle of don't cast your pearls before swine. Um, so don't waste your time speaking in the hearing of a fool. He will despise the wisdom of your words. In other words, if he, he has this attitude of disdain for wisdom, you're probably wasting your time. And so don't cast your pearls before swine. Let's move on. Let's talk about removing the ancient landmarks. Now, this one is quite interesting, and I couple that with verse 
11 as well. So notice point six and seven. Don't remove ancient landmarks and don't oppress the fatherless. Um, do not remove the ancient landmark. Didn't we have a question on that? I think we did. Did we not? Yes. Question number three. What does that mean? Do not remove the ancient landmark. Yeah, don't take something that doesn't belong to you. What else? Say again. Yeah, they mark boundaries. This is an ancient landmark, which means it's a well-established point of reference. Does that make sense? It's an ancient. This is not something that somebody just threw up. Your neighbor says, well, this is where my, my property starts. This is an ancient landmark. This is something that sets the boundary between you and your neighbor. And so the idea is don't take advantage of those that you can take advantage of, that you could easily take advantage of. In other words, don't take their land. In other words, suppose you had, uh, were next door neighbors to someone that was old and they couldn't see and the boundary was a post in the ground that you could easily move. Don't go out there and move it just because they can't see it and because they'll never know. And so you take a few more feet or a few more uh, uh, have another acre or two from them. Don't do that. And so it's in that context, neither enter the field of the fatherless. Uh, in other words, take advantage of them. Here's the fatherless that, that you can take advantage of. So don't take advantage of those that you could easily take advantage of. And why? Well, um, you say it's not right. That's not what I'm looking for. Look at verse 11 is what I'm after. All right, what does that mean? Yeah, he controls it. You're not going to get away with it. Their redeemer, their goel, uh, their, their deliverer is mighty. In other words, they have one that defends them. Same word that was used with reference to Job talking about he had a redeemer, a defender, deliverer. Uh, and so they have a deliverer that will plead their cause. Uh, you will not escape uh, those that are um, fatherless, uh, or, or you will not escape taking advantage of those who are, are fatherless, etc. There's a principle, I think, involved in verse 10. Don't remove the ancient landmarks. This is not what it's talking about in the context, but here is a, a well-established boundary. Don't remove that. Could we do that doctrinally sometimes? Remove the ancient landmark. Could we do that morally? Something that we, we know is wrong, but now we're going to make it right in our eyes. We've moved the ancient landmark. Now, that's not what it's talking about in the context, but it's a principle. Don't move the ancient landmarks. All right, let's talk about listening to wisdom. There are several verses here, 12, 15, 16, 19, 20, uh, 2, 23, 24, 25, 26. So let's expand that and subdivide that a little bit. Let's work our way through this. All through the Proverbs, there's the warning of listening to wisdom and, and not turning a deaf ear to that. So verse 12 and verse 19, apply your ears and heart. Well, just quickly, because this is a repeated principle, apply your ear to instruction, and, uh, your heart to instruction, your ears to the, to the words of knowledge. Same principle here. Uh, and be wise, verse 19. Now, verse 15 and 16, though, is kind of a new thought for us, at least in Proverbs. So what do you see in verse 15? It's as if the author is speaking to his son. And what does he say to his son? Yeah. Yeah. If, if, you, if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice. Yes, my inmost uh, being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. When I hear you speaking wisdom and you've listened to wisdom. So I've listed that simply. It's a, it's a joy to the instructor. That might be the parents. Uh, that might be the teacher. That might be the friend. Uh, have you ever taught somebody some principle of, of righteousness or wisdom? Maybe it's just a common sense that you talk to them and then you rejoice when you see them gaining that principle. Does that make sense? I've talked to a lot of younger preachers and given advice when I thought they were turning a deaf ear, and I'm thinking, they're not listening to me at all. But then you rejoice when you overhear them giving that same piece of advice to someone else. You know, maybe they got it. Maybe they got it. Maybe they were listening. All right, let's go to verse 16. Uh, closely connected, uh, same, verse, uh, same set of verses. The, uh, listening to wisdom results in wise speech and conversation. What, uh, what's that about? This is the father saying to his son, I rejoice because I'm hearing you speak wise things. I'm paraphrasing. 
So by listening to wisdom, that's going to result in speech that shows wisdom and wise conversation. So show me somebody that when you have a conversation that you're, you're just seeing foolishness written all over this conversation. I mean, this lack of judgment, lack of wisdom, they, they don't seem to have good common sense. Your conclusion is they haven't been, hadn't been taught, they haven't been listening to wisdom. And so it's going to result in wise conversation. Uh, verse 22, what do you learn? Absolutely. What do you learn from 22? It is wise, yeah, to listen to your parents. Listen to your father who begot you and do not despise the mother uh, when she is old. Um, wisdom means you show respect for your parents and it means you'll listen to the wisdom of your parents. Now verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. What does that mean? Hang on to it. Um, some have argued from that you can't sell a Bible. Um, you ought to give them away. Um, that's not what it's talking about. It's the idea of holding on to truth. And once you've got truth, don't, don't let it go. Don't sell out. Uh, don't sell it for uh, riches. Don't sell it for pleasure. Don't turn, turn loose of the wisdom of the truth. So hold on to the wisdom that you learn. And then 24 to 26, wisdom uh, brings, your wisdom brings joy to your parents. So the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He begets you, will, will delight in him. And uh, let your father and mother be glad. And that just means you live the way, the, the kind of life that will cause your parents to rejoice and be glad, um, et cetera. Make sense? Now, we didn't cover every detail in that, but that's about listening to wisdom, which is really what the book of Proverbs is all about. Questions, comments? All right, let's go further. Let's talk about point nine, child discipline, and let's go to our questions. Question number four. What is the rod of Proverbs 23, 13? A switch? Could be a belt. Literally, the word rod means shoot or branch. By shoot, what would a shoot mean? We don't normally use that term. If I said, uh, go out in the woods and get me a shoot. It's a branch, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a branch that shoots off, that's the idea, of from a tree. Uh, you, ever, you ever cut a tree down and you have a stump and then that growth that comes up beside it is a shoot. It's the idea. So it's a branch or a shoot, or in other words, we in our time would think of it as a switch. Um, so God's word encourages all through the book of Proverbs, corporal punishment. What's corporal punishment? If you had a visitor with you that didn't know much about language and they whisper in your ear, what does he mean corporal punishment? It's illegal in school, I guess something like spanking. Yeah. It's administering a spanking. God encourages that. Uh, may not be encouraged by our society, may be looked down upon, and in some countries and in some circles, even in some states, it may be illegal. Regardless of that, God encourages that. And uh, every passage that you have that deals with the rod. Now let's back up a little bit to chapter 22. Um, in verse 15, Drew tells me he didn't get very far into 22, so I'm not sure if you got verse 15 or not. Um, but foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. What does that mean? Yeah, the child's going to misbehave. And so don't be surprised if you've, if you've never been around children and you have a child, when that child comes into the world and begins to go, it's going to misbehave. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. Boys will be boys, girls will be girls, they're going to misbehave. That's not all the proverb. What's the rest of it say? The rod will drive it far from him. There's our word, rod, shoot or branch. A spanking will drive that behavior away. Didn't mean it would take it away the first time, but complied, applied consistently and repeatedly, it's going to drive it away from them. Make sense? All right, same concept. Let's go to, back to our text in verse 13 and 14. Let's see what we learn. Do not withhold correction from the child. 
But if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. What does that mean? The word beat here does not mean as we would use that term of abuse. Yeah. If you beat him with the rod, it ain't going to kill him. It ain't going to do that. It'll get, oh yeah, it'll get their attention. Let's go back to 19 and in verse 18. Chasing your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction or do not spare for his crying. I'm going to tell you, as, as a young parent, the, the, there are a number of Proverbs that, that helped me more than any book. People gave us books when our kids, when our children were born. Here's a good book for you. Here's a good book. Some of them were worthless. Some of them like Dobson's book, Gwendolyn Webb's book. Those were very helpful. Um, but the book that helped me more than any other book was the book of Proverbs. In passages like this right here at verse 8, uh, 19, 18, that do not set your heart on his destruction or do not spare for the crying. In other words, it ain't going to hurt the child. It may be painful, but it's good for the child. And then this passage in Proverbs 23 and in verse 13, that he'll not die. It won't kill him. But if you beat him with the rod, verse 14, you'll deliver his soul from hell. Now, it's true you'll deliver the soul from Gehenna, but that's Sheol here. And so I think it's the idea of, of, of the future. And so would it include Gehenna? Well, yeah, if you discipline the child now, you may be keeping them out of Gehenna hell, but you're going to keep them from death. You're going to keep them from destruction. You're going to keep them from future dangers. Make sense? So what you do now has a whole lot to do with the future. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about, uh, let's skip number 10. We've already talked about the tongue. And let's talk about the fear of God, 17 and 18. What do you learn from the fear of God? There's a contrast drawn. Don't let your heart envy sinners, but in the fear of the Lord continue all day long. Well, what do you learn from that? Contrast always teach me something. That if I'm envious of sinners, I'm not... Fearing God. If I fear God, I'm not going to be envious of sinners. How could you be envious of a sinner? Absolutely, yes. I'm envious. It's not that you're envious of someone who happens to be a sinner. I'm envious of their money, and it didn't matter if they were righteous or. But I'm envious of their money. That's not what he's talking about. You're envious of what they're able to do. They, they have freedom to live like they want to live, and they're not bound by restrictions, and they're able to uh, do whatever they want to do, and I'm bound by restrictions. Don't be envious of people in sin and their freedom and their liberty, because if that's your attitude, you don't fear God. Does that make sense? But if you fear God, you're not going to be envious of a sinner. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's go to uh, number, point number 12 and go to question number, um, number five. And that is, what do we learn about, um, I'll get the question in a moment. Question number five, it deals with the danger of wine and those who drink and list what lessons you learn about alcohol from these verses. What do you learn? Say again. Nothing ever good comes from alcohol. That's true. Good point. What else do we learn? You're not going to have anything if you're given uh, to alcohol. If you become an alcoholic, you'll probably die with nothing and you'll die gut or drunk. I had two first cousins that did, and they died with not a dime to their name, and, well, their lives were just worthless. What else do you learn? All right, yeah, nothing good comes from it. Let's start listing some, some things here, and we'll quickly notice this because we want to get to 24. Look at verse 20 and 21. Do not mix with wine, uh, wine bibbers or gluttons, and with a drunkard you'll come to poverty. And so here's the, uh, here's the, the thing I learned. From verse um, 20 and 21, don't associate with them. You say, but I don't drink. I, I, I'm not, don't associate with them. 
And the reason for that is they will influence you, verse 20 and 21. They'll have an influence on you. Whether you want it to or not, they will have an influence on you. So don't associate with those given to drinking. Verses 29 and 30, it's going to cause heartache. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds? It's the one that lingers at the wine, verse 30. It causes nothing but heartache. Uh, if you've known of somebody that's an alcoholic, they have nothing but problems because they're given to alcoholism. Verse 31 says it can be alluring. It can be alluring. It looks like it's the, you know, do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles, when it swirls smoothly. It looks good. looks like, man, particularly the advertisements, man, uh, the promise of what it'll do for me. Make me forget my problems. Make me have a good time. It's alluring. And then verses 32 to 35, we, don't, we won't develop all of this, but basically 32 to 35 is just description of, of just basically a gutter drunk. You want a picture of an alcoholic who has hit low? Read verses 32 to 35, and uh, it, your eyes will see strange things when you get drunk, and your heart will utter perverse things. You're going to say things that, are, that, are, that you'll regret saying. You're going to see things you've never seen before. Um, you're going to imagine things. Um, and uh, you'll be like one that lies down in the midst of the sea or like one that lies on the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. Uh, it, it's, it's a terrible description, verses 32 to 35. Quickly, let's talk about the immoral woman and then we'll get to 24. What do you learn about the immoral woman, verses 27 and 28? Nothing new. We've learned some principles, these principles before. The harlot is, a temp is tempting and alluring you, but she is a... Deep pit. What does that suggest? If you're going down a road and there's a deep pit. Trap. Yeah, you're going to fall in. You're going to fall into a hole and be hurt. You're going to fall uh, and get hurt with the immoral woman. So she's like a deep pit. Don't, don't go near her. Don't go. Just stay, stay away from the immoral woman. She lies in wait. In other words, she's, she's seeking to take her victims and she increases unfaithful men. She has created more uh, disasters uh, by her actions. All right, that's Proverbs 23. Let's see if we can get through 24 now. This looks like a lot, but we're going to sub, uh, subdivide this a little bit, see if we can. There's 15 major points. Let's start with the first seven, and then we'll get the rest of them. There's warnings about the evil companion, um, and so let's go to question six. What do you learn about evil companions from these verses here? All right. Absolutely. Verse 2. All right, let's start listing the things that have just been mentioned here. Number 1, verse, verse 1 said, don't be envious of them. In other words, don't look at people who are doing evil and again be envious of them, uh, as we've already talked about. Secondly, verse 2, they'll influence you. They, uh, their lips talk of troublemaking. Your associates, your friends will influence you. Verse 21, don't associate with them. Don't associate with those given to chain. You say, well, I want to put that in context. We will. So hang on, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, verse 22 uh, is a verse that talks about destruction comes, uh, the ruin that those two can bring. The two would be God and the king. Come back to that. And uh, look at verse 24 and 25. Uh, he that says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse. Those that take up verse 25 or rebuke the wicked, uh, rebuke the wicked will have delight. What's that saying? When you do have contact, finish my sentence. When you do have contact with those that are evil, don't blank them. Don't encourage them, but rather discourage them or rebuke them. Isn't that what he's saying? In other words, don't treat the, the ungodly like they're a godly person. Don't encourage them in, in what they're doing. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Let's talk about the value of wisdom now. The value of wisdom. Uh, verse 3, through wisdom a house is built. Uh, 
I don't think that's talking about a literal house, but a family and a home would be the idea. And by understanding it is established. So the value of wisdom to the household is better than riches. A house is built. Your family is built by wisdom. You, your family is not built with money. Your house may be, your, your dwelling may be, but your home and your family is built with wisdom. Make sense? So it's valuable. Uh, look at verse 4. It provides the necessities of, of life. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious, pleasant riches. Uh, it provides the necessities of life. In other words, common sense. And in verse 5, uh, the, a wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. What do you learn from that? Yeah, wisdom makes you strong. That's where true strength is. Not physical strength. Uh, not having great intellect, but having wisdom. That's where your true strength is. If you have wisdom, if you take Proverbs and you read it, and you read it, and you read it, and you read it, and you got the principle of it, you're going to be strong. You're going to be strong. All right, let's go to point uh, three, seeking advice. This is not the first time we've seen this. So let's go to verse six. By wise counsel, you will wage your own war, and the multitude of counselors, their safety. What is that saying? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. We have a proverb in the present day saying two heads are better than one. Uh, seek your wisdom, seek advice. And um, I think that would suggest not only among those, don't just ask advice from those that you know are going to regurgitate your opinion. You might ask advice from somebody that may give you a differing opinion and test it because their opinion may not be good but you can see the fallacy of that. Or maybe you see the value of it. And so seek some wisdom, seek advice, uh, seek counsel. Um, let's talk about, um, I'm going to skip uh, verse 7 there, not because it's unimportant. It's quite obvious, uh, the point of that. Point 5, evil men. This one's interesting. Look at verses 8 and 9 about evil men. Verse 8 says, he who plots to do evil will be called a schemer, devising the foolishness of sin. Um, evil men think evil. Evil men plan to do evil. They plan to do wrong. That's obvious. Um, let's drop down at verse 15. Evil men will do this. What will they do? What does that mean? They lie and wait. Yeah. Evil men will set a snare for you. Evil men will entrap you. Evil men are not seeking your good. They're evil. They're evil after all. They're not righteous people trying to make you better. They're going to seek. So be careful. Keep your eyes uh, alerted and open. Now, we didn't cover every verse under evil men. I'm more interested now in going to point six, dealing with adversity. What do you learn from verse 10? If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that when you go through adversity, be ready for that. Because if in the midst of adversity you throw up your hands and quit, you weren't very strong. So I want to be prepared for that so I'm not throwing up my hands and quitting. And so it has to do with persevering and endurance. Uh, let's go to how God knows how we treat other people. Uh, we'll see what we learn about that. Look at verse 11 and 12. Uh, Deliver those who are drawn to death and hold back those stumbling to slaughter. And if you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart consider it? What do you learn? And then the rest of verse 11, that he who, uh, he, will he not rendered each one according to his deeds? What do you learn? Okay. We can make that application. <coughs> you 
Yeah. yeah here, here is someone who is suffering an injustice. Uh, stand up with those who suffer injustice. Stand up with those who are weaker. Stand up with those who are for or help or support those who may be in trouble. And if I say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know. Well, God knows that you knew. And he will render each one according to his deeds. So don't refuse to help those uh, who may need help. Uh, look at verse 29. This is in this context, God knows how we treat others. God's watching, and so I can fool you by saying, you know what, I didn't realize that I could have helped. I didn't realize. God knows whether that's true or not, and God will render that. Now verse 29, what does it say? Don't take revenge. Do not say I'll do to him just as he's done to me. That's just the, the reverse wording, same point, but reverse wording of Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule. Same one, same principle. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Don't treat them the way you have been treated. All right, let's go now to, uh, let's go to verse 16. Uh, uh, we've only got time to deal with a couple of these. I want to deal with, uh, now I want to drop down to number 11. Uh, the fear of, the, uh, of God in the king. Now this one's interesting because we only have a minute or two to go. Um, hip if I was on the right page. Yeah, here we go. Uh, fear the Lord and the king and do not associate with those given to change. I think that's talking about probably a, a rebellion against our insurrection, uh, a, an effort to overthrow um, the government. I believe the English standard words that do not associate with those who do otherwise. In other words, they don't fear God and they don't fear the king. So don't associate with those who have no respect for God and they don't have any respect for the king. It doesn't mean the king's righteous. It just means we need to fear the king. The New Testament teaches that, 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, now, for their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin those two can bring. I think that's God and the king. So you rebel against God and the king or rebel against the king, thinking I'm not rebelling against God, you don't know the ruin that God and the king can bring upon you. So uh, uh, fear God and fear the king. Um, now let's go to verse 27 and then we're going to stop with that and uh, we'll leave it alone there. Uh, prepare your outside work and make, make it fit for yourself in the field and afterward build your house. I think the point of the proverb is take care of necessities before convenience. And so it's the idea of going, you work in the field, you go out and work in the field to take care of, of providing for yourself, making your income, raising your crop, and then build your house. Don't go build your house and then you say, but I don't have any income because I wasn't working in the field. But I've got a nice house to live in. Um, and so it's the idea of taking care of necessities. Uh, produce before you consume. It's also the principle. You need to produce before you consume. Quite often we start borrowing money before we even have a job. And so we're consuming and we haven't produced a thing. And so get your money before you start spending. Produce before you consume, number one, and then have necessities before you have convenience. Pre-plan. Pre verse 27, powerful verse. We're going to stop at that. That's Proverbs 23 and 24.